Welcome everyone and um, uh, to this uh, joint uh, C-Center ICROSS event uh, on securing electoral processes. Well, electing for peace, question mark, uh, democracy and peace building in the 21st century. Um, well, I think I know most everyone. I tried to get around to introduce myself, but I'm Tim Sis, a professor here at the Corbell School and uh, director of the Institute for Comparative and Regional Studies. And uh, the first thing um, most obviously to say is in a week 10 of the quarter on a little snow day here in Denver, I just wanna thank you all for turning out uh, to this event. We know that it's uh, you know kind of finals uh, week and otherwise here at the Corbell School. At the same time, we have our distinguished guests here whom I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, to um, uh, back here to the Corbell School. And so we wanted to put on a kind of more open event. And I'd also like to welcome those who may be joining us uh, uh, online here today uh, on this event, Electing for Peace. And in fact, um, you know, just uh, here in Colorado, we have a very specific local context for this event. And that is that just last week, the governor of Colorado, Jared Polis, signed legislation signed a bill into law that was passed by the Colorado House that would increase uh, fines uh, and it would in fact make a felony um, efforts to threaten uh, or intimidate election officials in Colorado. And in fact, we have a uh, pending now in the Colorado House, uh, House Bill uh, 1273, uh, which would go even further in terms of efforts to secure and protect elections uh, with the midterm elections here in Colorado. As you may know, there have been threats against uh, election officials here, uh, going back to the stop the steal uh, language from 2020 uh, and looking forward. So this, this issue of electing for peace uh, and elections and conflict prevention is both one that is uh, very salient here locally in Colorado and of course through the United States as we see uh, a lot of concern about upcoming electoral cycles, but also globally. And You all follow quite the news like I do. I'm a, a, I'm a self-described election observer for the very disruptive uh, elections in Angola in 1992, elections that um, that uh, led to the renewal of civil war in Angola and another 150,000 fatalities after those failed elections, which were run by the United Nations uh, at the time, uh, and uh, all the way through to the present and working on some of these issues uh, right here in Colorado, but also globally. As I looked around the news uh, this morning, there were really three electoral processes that are sort of headlines in the news today. One might be called the Squid Game elections, uh, which are unfolding in South Korea. We still don't know the outcome of those, but highly contentious mudslinging, online threats, threats uh, against women in the electoral process that we've seen in those elections, you know, in South Korea coming out of a period of democratization, uh, a, a lot of, uh, it's kind of emblematic of some of the troubled elections around the world uh, that we've seen. And then of course, um, uh, just uh, Tuesday of this week, in Geneva, uh, Madame Michelle Bachelet, the U United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, read out loud in the Human Rights uh, Council a report on Nicaragua uh, calling for the president of Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega, to, um, to uh, basically um, begin uh, reestablishing credible elections after the uh, very uh, disruptive and in fact uh, captured elections 
that happened last year in Nicaragua. Now let's keep in mind too that um, just uh, earlier this week, the United States uh, House of Representatives uh, committee, a select committee that is investigating the 2020 issues here in the United States, um, uh, found that there is evidence to suggest uh, former President Trump's complicity um, in spreading false information around the 2020 election, which led to the January 6th riot um, and insurrection here in the United States. So these issues of elections are like all over the news and we couldn't be better served than to have some of the, I would say the top uh, uh, practitioners in election support with us here on the DU campus uh, for this week for a capstone session of a course that some of you have been involved with. We've been running over the past uh, 10 weeks an advanced practicum that includes some of our uh, top uh, Corbell MAs uh, who were working on issues of elections and conflict prevention, uh, as well as practitioners from the Carter Center and from International IDEA. Um, who uh, together have been exploring some of these issues of elections and conflict uh, dynamics. Let me pull the um, nice picture of the book clips back up here for us. It should come up in a minute. There we go. That's in Western Colorado. Anybody wants to ask me about that, I'd be happy to bend your ear about mountain biking in the, in the uh, book clips and uh, I've been through the Colorado. Um, Nonetheless, let me introduce our panel uh, here today because we are really well served with uh, top uh, academic and practitioner specialists on issues of elections and conflict prevention. Let me uh, introduce them in the order of their speaking. We sort of set it up uh, among ourselves as to uh, how to um, proceed today. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce to the, you who may not know him, Fletcher Cox, my friend and indeed former doctoral student here at the Corbell School. So yes, Kelsey, there's life after doctoral student. <laughs> Uh, here at the Corbell School. Uh, Fletcher finished uh, his uh, PhD here, where he did some fantastic research up in Northeast Kenya in looking, uh, sorry, Northwest Kenya, I always get that wrong. Northeast Kenya, um, very difficult environment up in Northeast Kenya. Fletcher went up to Northwest Kenya where he worked previously in humanitarian assistance and looked at six different communities and under what conditions do communities see escalation to violence. Uh, since then, Fletcher uh, has uh, gone on to do great things. He's an associate professor at William Jewell College uh, in Missouri, and uh, we've worked together over the years on a number of projects, a book on social cohesion and deeply divided societies. We worked on a project called Innovations for Peace, which looked at local level peace infrastructure, something which may come up uh, in our discussion today. Uh, and indeed, Fletcher comes to us uh, even before Corbell with a master's in uh, theological studies from the Harvard Divinity School. And uh, so nice that he got his uh, BS uh, in communication and religion there at William Jewell. Uh, so we're very pleased to have Fletcher here uh, with us today. Uh, and then I'll introduce um, also my colleague, and these are all my friends actually, so I'll just kind of <laughs> continue with the colleague and friend nomenclature here. Therese Pierce Alanala is the head of elections for International IDEA. Uh, IDEA is uh, Institute for Democracy and Election Assistance, which is a Stockholm-based intergovernmental organization with about 20, 27 member states? 36. 36 <laughs> member states, uh -huh, very good, 36 member states. So as an intergovernmental organization, International IDEA is, uh, I think, the preeminent organization working in the field of elections globally, and indeed on democracy more fully. Perhaps some of you are familiar with the IDEA State of Democracy reports, Global State of Democracy, the last report having just come out uh, toward the end of 2021, which tracks trends and patterns of democracy around the world. Uh, Therese has worked in electoral processes for um, about as long as I have, um, 30 years or so. And um, she's worked for a number of organizations uh, prior to that and during that, in addition to IDEA uh, with the United Nations Development Program and uh, the uh, really the full suite of partner organizations to include, for example, uh, the Carter Center. Um, she's also finishing up um, 
her doctoral uh, work on trust and electoral management bodies through the Australian uh, National University. And uh, we're very pleased to have Therese here, uh, I think as one of the, the truly top specialists right in this field. Uh, last but not least, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Siad Alihojic. Siad um, is a, uh, also at International IDEA. He's a senior program manager. And I think um, as, for those who've been in the course with us know that Siad has done more than anyone, I think in the world to develop an integrated election risk assessment instrument, which looks at sort of what can go wrong in elections with regard to the internal processes, what can go wrong with elections in terms of the broader context or environment, such as social polarization, and uh, has worked in many countries uh, globally um, that have taken this tool and implemented it in elections to what assess the potential for election related violence, which then leads to then designing efforts for conflict prevention uh, and intervention. So we're very pleased to have uh, Siad with us, who comes to us um, with an MA from the University of Essex uh, and also um, a bachelor's degree from uh, the University of Sarajevo. And uh, prior to joining International IDEA in 2008, uh, Siad was with the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, uh, working uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we're very pleased to have to have uh, Siad here with us today. So. Um, uh, I think uh, what we can do is uh, maybe we'll go ahead and write and start with uh, Fletcher. I'll go ahead and pass along the clicker to Fletcher and open up your uh, PowerPoint here to, uh, to get us going. Well, thank you so much, Fletcher. Take this away. What we're looking at here, I'll just briefly introduce the flow of our uh, programming here this uh, this afternoon. Fletcher has done a lot of work, in fact, has a new project, which will be uh, working on uh, in conjunction with IDEA, will be in the IDEA headquarters uh, as for next year, starting in Stockholm, and then working at the university at Uppsala University in Uppsala, Sweden, and uh, confronting authoritarianism is where we're starting, and we'll move to Therese, we'll talk about what makes for a credible election uh, election that is uh, that that is transparent, inclusive, uh, and uh, indeed competitive, which is a requirement of a credible collection, uh, election. And then move to uh, see its work on preventing election-related violence and and uh, assessing the potential for it. So, uh, Fletcher, thank you so much. Takes away on confronting authoritarianism. Thanks, Tim. I just want to make sure. Clicker. Is it not working? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay. That clicker's finicky. <laughs> and I have a dot too. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, I think good. I have the tools I need. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really just an honor to be a part of this panel today. Uh, it's been so much fun to be part of the ongoing course as well. Um, yeah, as Tim mentioned, I'm Fletcher Cox, currently associate professor at William Jewell College. Um, but the project I'm going to present to you today is going to be what I'm working on over the next year while I'm a visiting researcher at the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University and collaborating as well with International Ideas. So see, these are some of the early stages of uh, project design that I'm hoping are really raising some big, bold questions about the nature of the relationship between electoral assistance, um, dynamics of conflict prevention, in an era of increasing autocratization. So um, I have 15 slides in 15 minutes, which as you know, does not work well. So get ready, this is gonna be a, kind of a harrowing journey uh, through some of, the, some of the data. I wanna do two things today. Um, I'll, be, I'll be your be page, page down. Right <laughs> page yeah, up, page down. Ready for the <laughs> Okay, so just a couple of things I want to do. So part one, I was, let's, let's do some work visualizing autocratization. Um, political scientists don't even agree on how to measure democracy, right? That's one of the things we know and compared to politics. Some of you are nodding. I, yeah, I took that course. We don't agree how to measure democracy. But one of the things that we're agreeing on right now is that, well, autocratization is happening no matter how 
you measure it. So I'm gonna just give you some images from some of the top research programs and international organizations working on autocratization. And then I'm going to show you some of the things I've found in, um, maybe it's a literature review, but I think it's more than that. I think it's a work I've been doing over the last year to really deeply listen to the way that scholars are talking about how to so-called bridge the divide. Take what we know from academia and turn that into recommendations about how we could potentially make democracy more resilient in an increasingly complicated world. So that's what I've been doing. Not, it's, been, <laughs> it's not just kind of digging through journals because uh, I'm going to show you very clearly that after January 6th in the United States, there's been a big conversation happening in the public space around this. So these are the two things that I want to do. The first way that we can visualize autocratization is through a tale of two reports. So Tim mentioned some of the projects uh, we've worked on together. And um, if you, maybe I can click. Would that be easier, Tim? <laughs> yeah, I think it would be. I, I know this little device here. And as Mary knows, I had issues yeah. with it in class the other Should day. Should I take too. your seat? Or would, but would that, that be... should do it right there. Or otherwise, we can just simply um, make it easy. and Slide, slide it over. Slide yeah, let's device right let's, here let's do that so there I can we. not. I have to worry about too much navigation. Okay, so here was the International Ideas Report in 2017. I was a research associate um, kind of helping do some of the background work for this particular report. And you can already see in the title, Exploring Democracy's Resilience. And I just want to show you one of the key findings that was published there in the uh, kind of front material of this particular report. The current global state of democracy is one of trendless fluctuations, right? <laughs> that's that's not very long ago. That's about five years ago. And again, if you go to this, the front cover of the newest report from International Idea, we're not just exploring resilience. What are we doing? There's a different word there. Someone just read it for me. What, if you can see it, <laughs> what, what does it say? We're not just exploring resilience. We are building. building it. And that to me is an important indicator that there's this moment where we need to do some things. We really need to react to autocratization, if we want to use that word, or at least really deep pressures on democracies that are uh, creating big questions around resilience. So I'm going to rapid fire through some other ways to visualize this. But a couple of scholars in 2019 have given us um, this, this language of a wave of autocratization. And so some researchers can say, we can look at what's happening now as a kind of trend that's been going on since the mid nineties. The number of countries that are experiencing autocratization relative to the number of experiencing right, democratization kind of moving in these different directions. And so we've known in political science that there's this, been wave, this wave has been going on for quite some time. But let me just show you why we're now trying to kind of build, build resilience, because things have happened in the last three years that have really created this critical juncture. So this is, this is a graph from VDEM, Varieties of Democracy, their latest report, which is titled Autocratization Turns Viral. And you can see there right in 2019, maybe I can use my red dot here. You can see there right in 2019 that the number of right, democratizing, democratizing countries starts to fall relative to the number of autocratizing countries. But then the thing that has everyone saying we really should pay attention to this trend is what's going on in this other graph. If you actually map this in relationship to share of world's population, this is where the trend line really starts to look sharp. And so what's going on there? Mm, India <laughs> is one of the big reasons. But if we bump over to Freedom House, we can also start to see that Freedom House, again, they measure democracy in a different way because we don't agree how to measure democracy, but it comes from the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And they give us uh, these top, uh, this top uh, list of countries that are experiencing declines in freedom. So again, it's not just India. These declines in freedom are occurring in multiple countries. Um, what else can we, how else can we visualize this? Some of you may have tracked the debate around Polity 5. This is the Center for Systemic Peace. They also study regime type. And so the big thing that made news about, uh, about a year and a half ago was that according to policy five, the United States, the world's oldest democracy may now be an anocracy. It may no longer be a consolidated democracy. And so I'm gonna put in big red bracket right here, why? They measure three things to try to understand democracy and its patterns, right? Executive recruitment, that stays pretty solid. 
Political competition, that you know, stays pretty solid over time, but the key dynamic in the United States that was really backsliding was around executive constraints. So just hold on to that concept because that's a story that we've all been really close to over these past few years. How else can we visualize democracy? I told that in the day, there are lots of ways to visualize this. So many different research programs are saying autocratization is happening. If you measure it in different ways, you can still see this playing out. So the Economist Intelligent Unit, uh, Intelligence Unit says a new low for global democracy, thinking about how the pandemic has damaged freedoms. And then here we are, international idea, putting together what I think is an even more interesting map that again calculates for, uh, that calculates for population weights and also has other categories around kind of high performing democracies, mid range performing democracies and this really important category of so-called backsliding democracy. Okay, now I can take a bit deep, <laughs> deep breath. There are lots of ways to visual, visualize what's going on here, but it's clear from multiple sources that autocratization is occurring, it's on the move. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is start to show you how I've been working to map and classify theories, ideas, strategies, and tactics that are out there now in the public space that are coming from political science research to try to, again, so-called bridge this gap. What do we know in this old, long-running question in political science about autocratization that might get us to some policy recommendations about how we might be able to prevent dem democratic backsliding? And as you know, this is also a really, really busy space. It only got busier after this day. So I'm about to show you the graph that I've been developing to try to do this deep listening. So lots of different experts in this field who are saying, here's what we know about electoral uh, conflict and autocratization from Kenya. Here's what we know from Kyrgyzstan. Here's what we know from all of these other experiences that may be relevant to the United States situation. That particular moment caused a, um, a really unique opportunity for me to feel like a mad scientist. I could fill, I could fill up, I was filling up boards and notes, kind of mapping out these arguments that here are the key causal mechanisms, and therefore this is what we should do. How many argue, how many arguments have you read from political science researchers saying, here's what we know from this, now here's what we should do. Okay, so here's what my initial table looks like. Okay, yeah, was, <laughs> just to give you a sense. This is, this is a busy space. Here's what we know from political science research. Here's what we should do. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you there are at least four categories of things that scholars trying to be policy relevant are saying we should do. One category is around so-called operational prevention. And I'm not going to read through all of these, but I'm just gonna highlight some of the tasks that researchers say we should focus on kind of during the operations of elections that have really caught my attention. One of the things that's really standing out to me is a lot of scholars are saying we really need to think about intra-party dynamics and the extent to which parties play an unbelievably important role in so-called anti-democracy enablement. And again, I think this is something that really opens up interesting conversations about how you leverage parties and their internal dynamics to try to prevent autocratization or democratic backsliding. The other thing that I'm really going to point out is there's a lot of research now that's saying we should probably really invest in constructing early warning systems, especially around foreign meddling and this tactic of kind of foreign meddling through information systems to lead to early announcements. Because an early announcement can sow uncertainty about an electoral outcome and autocrats kind of learn from each other and it seems that this is kind of a tactic that's spreading around the world that if we kind of sow uh, confusion very, very early on, that could create a potential crisis moment. And I'm going to show you in another slide that creating a crisis moment is a good moment at which a autocrat to be can then um, put in place new rules that start to slowly erode the rules of democracy. 
So this is really catching my attention around early warning systems and what they might look like. The other thing, I mean, after a conversation just in our class, <laughs> even last week, is that a lot of new conversations around so-called citizen resilience, right? And I'm thinking about that too, as a professor working with um, students between 18 and 22 most days, um, we haven't experienced this before. And so what does it mean to be a resilient citizen in watching how autocratization is playing out in multiple contexts around the world. So operational prevention is a big conversation here. The next is institutional prevention. This is around changing the rules, not just thinking about operations of electoral processes, but really changing the rules for how they work. And again, this is messy. There's a lot, but I'm gonna focus on a few of the things, again, that have just caught my attention. Um, huge finding about the importance of apolitical security institutions. I'm just going to leave it there. That's a big conversation. But when security institutions become politicized, again, this is one of the high risk um, kind of predictive factors in political science of autocratization potentially coming next. So conversations around rules and incentives for candidate moderation to limit outbidding. I was going to let Tim jump in on this later because of his area of expertise. This is really, really important. Um, and you can design electoral systems that create incentives for moderation within parties. And I only think that this uh, conversation is going to get more important over time in multiple uh, uh, contexts. Big conversation around media rules and regulations. Um, we're seeing in the media this problem of, again, kind of here's the jargon in political science and other uh, kind of interdisciplinary approaches, is problem of so-called audience capture, meaning that there's a lot of money to be made if you can capture a specific audience rather than speak broadly to a number of informed citizens. And so this dynamic of audience capture seems to be an, uh, eroding so-called mutual toleration. Again, multiple contexts. We can probably, of course, my, I've, I have tunnel vision on the United States case right now because it's, we've been thinking about it so much. But again, these are coming out in multiple contexts. The last one here is there are a number of scholars who were saying, We've learned a lot about the need for expert commissions on constitutional reform, and we might need to revisit that type of institution in places that haven't experienced that before, as well as the possibility of truth commissions. Tim was just talking about some of the cutthroat tactics that are being used in elections, and I think, to be honest, we should expect that. We should expect elections to be really nasty and dirty with backbiting. And so what is going to happen after an election you're going to need a moment of telling the truth and potentially finding paths toward reconciliation after these traumatic experiences. And so again, th this seems to be emerging as a space for really um, innovative conversations about what needs to come next. Okay, structural prevention. This is the stuff where I also need to take a deep breath. Oh, this is the long, hard, really difficult systems level stuff that scholars are talking about that, again, might have implications for policy. And so what does this conversation look like? I'm, gonna, gonna, um, I'm moving to our conclusion here, but I'll highlight a few things in this conversation around so-called structural prevention. OK, one of them is this really important conversation around so-called informal norms among elites, especially related to forbearance. In that last slide, the conversation around formal institutions, meaning we need to get the constitution right, we need to write the rules down, how parties operate, how our elect like the formal rules, the stuff that's written down. All of that works up until a point at which you have human beings who decide that it's going to be electorally beneficial for them to break those rules. And so that's an informal norm. And so I think there's a really important conversation around, around this norm of forbearance. How do you get elites to respect this norm? I think that's a really important question coming out of this. Um, really important conversations around uh, the reforming discriminatory social, discriminatory social institutions to build broad pro-democracy coalitions, right? If your coalition for uh, democracy is concentrated within a politi par particular political party, that's probably not going to get you far, very far. So these dynamics of coalition building are really emerging from this. Um, Anti-hate group mobilization, the challenge of spoilers. A lot of researchers who focus on uh, CVE, countering violent extremism, basically shouted after January 6th, we know what we need to do. We've learned about how to counter violent extremism and prevent spoilers. Here are our lessons learned. And again, I think that's an important crossover space and a moment of interdisciplinarity that, um, that is going to only uh, be more relevant as we move forward. 
Um, the other thing here that I'm kind of inspired by some of my recent research on the case of Kyrgyzstan is that the potential need for deep citizen dialogues on citizenship, right? Questions around what identity is, moving beyond this idea that identity is something that's innate, it's fixed, it's, it's not malleable to something that's socially constructed. And a lot of sociologists are saying, we need to have that conversation and know that identity is, again, um, doesn't get us into the situation where everything is gonna win or lose within an electoral cycle for your particular group. And that conversation I think is emerging as well. Okay, I have one more slide, but I've gone three minutes over time. So I'm gonna stop. I'm just gonna show you what it looks like. I have one more big set of conversations that really get complex around so-called global prevention. This is around global governance and international institutions. And this one really starts, uh, this is really the kind of 30,000 foot view of this, asking questions around how to create resilient international institutions in relationship to the so-called globalization paradox, where it might become more difficult for states to actually deliver on the promises that they make to their citizens. So I hope this has been useful. Again, this is gonna be scene setting work to try to get a sense of where this conversation is and where it has the potential to move over time. Thank you very much. Great, yeah, thank you, much. thank you so much. And uh, I, I think it's a nice uh, segue. One of the things that we've had a lot of conversations over the last week, the last 10 weeks or so, and one of the points that Therese has made um, importantly and repeatedly is around that citizenship issue and public education and really thinking about the um, responsibility for security, right? As you suggested on International Women's Day yesterday, that we, that, you know, this notion of citizen resilience is also kind of reconceptualizing what, what it takes to uh, provide security in electoral processes. So please uh, turn it over to Therese. Uh, I'll go back to the, uh, to the book clips uh, here in uh, Western Colorado for our backdrop and uh, turn it over to Trey. Thank, uh, thank you so much. And that was gorgeous uh, scene setting. I'll, I'll get more specific and concrete so we can imagine um, somebody who's, you know, who's got an election to organize coming up. Um, this scene setting is not particularly helpful because there are no people in it, um, <laughs> but <laughs> it could be helpful to make um, one point, which I will make, which is um, how hard it can be the, just to not forget the logistics of elections. And this could be a good reminder that when we deal with um, the logistics of elections, that it, it could be this type of terrain that we have to organize voting uh, in. And so we can, in that way, the, uh, the picture can be a little bit helpful. Um, I've had the pleasure, as, as Tim um, introduced, of, of working with elections on the election management side or with those who manage elections for the past 30 years. And um, I will, my, my topic is what we need to think about um, to have elections that are trustworthy, but I'm going to preface it with, with three points. And the first point to, to set the scene is that, and, and following from what both Fletcher and Tim said, is this is a different moment. I, I've been working with this for a long time, but suddenly things are, 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 are very, very different. And I'll try to explain the difference in, in three ways that I've noticed, but in fact, it's, it's, it's many more. Um, but it's how I've noticed the trends that you saw there, but how I've, I've seen it um, playing out. Um, so one of the differences I'm seeing is that where elections were once kind of taken for granted and under the radar, like when we deal with, we work together, Sam and I, and, and we work with election commissions and, Often, especially in, in more mature, advanced democracies, the older democracies, um, it's, it's a bit of an under the radar job. It, it's sometimes relegated somewhere and, and it, not maybe a well-known job. We can think of the example of public health officials. Before we didn't know the name of our public health officials, but now after the pandemic, we suddenly do. And I think we can see the equivalence um, in, in the election sphere. This has been the case for a long time. Um, in other parts of the world. There are parts of the world where the election commissioner's name is as well known as, you know, the Supreme Court judge and so forth. And so the second change that I'm going to mention is that what used to be uh, dynamics of protecting elections that we saw in the 
in, in post-conflict countries, so-called countries that were maybe somewhere else, is, is now here. And um, so I think there's a lot of learning that can be done from those who have been through protecting their democracies from um, an authoritarianism that, that had passed. So I think we can learn a lot, for example, from, from South America as they emerged from, from authoritarianism. We can learn from, from Southern Europe. Um, we can learn a lot from uh, Southern Africa as they emerged from apartheid and tried to build confidence in democratic institutions that were participatory. We can learn from, from the Philippines where um, uh, the, the, the people engaged in electoral processes and watched it and really invented um, what we now call election observation, which is done all over the place. So this, what used to be something that was somewhere else is now global and interconnected. And that just brings me to my final point of, of, of change, which is that um, when I began working with elections, we saw it as building electoral institutions. So it was the sense that you were, you were building something. And then maybe 10 years into this, um, so I began in the 90s, uh, about 10 years in, in the early 90s, we realized that, oops, you can't just build something. You have to think of sustainability. And, and we started to think more about capacity building and so forth. So we can call that consolidating democracy or consolidating electoral processes. And now, because of all of what we're discussing here, we are squarely in protecting elections mode. So it is, um, and the, so that was my first point is that, that this is a moment in time. And then my second introductory point is that this is existential. If we do not protect these electoral systems, these electoral processes, these electoral institutions, there really isn't another alternative that is palatable to my knowledge. There is nothing that can organize um, uh, transitions, political transitions or, or stable governments. There is no other way that, that I know about or that we've invented um, to this point. So it's existential that we have to um, uh, achieve this. Um, and then my third point is there is no checklist. You can't say they did it like this. You know, Australia runs elections really, really, really well. Um, they have compulsory voting, not sure it would work here. They have ballot papers that are this size, not sure that that would work somewhere else. So it's, it's, there's no checklist or template that you can take from one place to another. We've got to figure it out. So it's existential, but there's no template. But here are a few points that we can take with us to guide us as we design institutions that people can trust. And one is just foundational, and that is excellent delivery. Organizing elections is really, really hard. If we imagine Indonesia, where you need to um, reach every single of those remote islands in one day, and plus your, um, you know, the, the very dense urban areas where you're living, you're, you're, you're providing a service in a gigantic uh, area, well, depending on the size of your country, but in one day, and that means you are recruiting an army of temporary officers who are going to be doing this very delicate frontline work. In India, it is over a million people who are working on, on those election uh, days. And um, that getting that many people up to speed for, for one day of critical work. These days, there are multiple ways of Voting. And this increased dramatically during the pandemic. We're now voting uh, not only in polling stations, which we might have become accustomed to, but rapidly moving to, to postal voting or advanced voting or, or smartphone voting, um, all kinds of different ways of voting, uh, proxy voting, you know, em envelope based voting, where somebody brings your, your vote somewhere else. And each one of these has their own stream of logistics, of costs, of competencies, um, and vulnerabilities to something going um, wrong or somebody taking a, a picture of and, and projecting it on social media and projecting the idea that something's gone wrong. So election delivery and doing it excellently is, is foundational to, to trustworthy elections. And I just wanna say that's foundational, but it's not particularly easy. It takes planning, it takes costs, it takes very competent and dedicated people. So let's keep that in mind. 
But when it comes to the, and that's always been the case. Um, so that's, that's, that's foundational and not just for this moment in time, but has always been the case. And that's normally the area in which we work. So that was kind of our specialty. And the ones I'm gonna say now are more recent because uh, this is um, new territory. Um, fearless independence is the next one I wanna bring up. And so you have to deliver excellently, but um, we need to reinforce a point that many other countries in the world have, have learned, but um, the independence of the electoral authorities is, is really key. And I'm adding the word fearless because being independent and nonpartisan can be very, very scary. It can be a frightening. And those of us, and those of you who were um, at the seminar yesterday, we talked about um, violence against um, female election officials, but that um, the, the threats against election officials are, are real as we heard from the Colorado, um, the Colorado case. So um, daring to enforce electoral rules um, is, 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 is putting yourself out there. Um, independence is not a new thing. I know here, uh, I, I want to point out that the US and Europe are lagging. About 60% of commissions in the world or election authorities are, are, are independent ones. And Europe is picked up on this and is moving in that direction. So Sweden's moved, the UK is moving in that direction. Um, Ireland has committed to moving um, to, to introducing an, an independent election commission. So where once it was part of the government, it is now uh, moving towards independent authorities who oversee the elections, even though they're often maybe run by local authorities. So um, the next, so fearless independence, and excellent delivery are the two that I've mentioned so far. The next one, and here I want to borrow from um, a colleague who is on the webinar um, and who is, for those of you who are here from Denver, she is your former director of elections and she's now um, on the uh, US um, Postal Service Board. But um, she speaks about and advocates very um, uh, passionately for what she calls radical transparency. And that is, we can see that idea of radical transparency in a number of ways. Um, if we think about that excellent delivery, it is now no longer um, just enough to, to do your, your ballot transportation and your, your vote counting excellency, excellently, so you get an excellent result and ballots are delivered on time. These days, because aspects of electoral management are becoming politicized, it is critical that we start to think about doing it, tracking it in a way that many, many, many people can see. So I'll give the example of Australia. Um, Australia organizes elections very well, but got a little bit complacent. And in 2013, in Western Australia, they lost 4,000 ballots, disappeared. This um, meant they had to rerun the uh, Senate elections at a cost of 20 million Australian dollars and delayed uh, Australia's budget that year. It was a disaster for the election um, commission. Luckily, they rebuilt trust after that. They took it very, very seriously as did the parliaments. And they have built in a, a ballot um, tracking system um, that is not only um, state of the art, but they've also inculcated a culture of, of seeing ballots as absolutely precious. Where there had been complacency, there was now this idea that, um, that it, it, this, this mattered. So this, this radical transparency isn't just the, the technical dimension, but it's also uh, the, the culture of not only are we doing this right, but we are showing that we're doing it right. Radical transparency can also be seen um, in what we need to think about in money and politics, that we, we need to know where money is coming from and where it's going. And there are, are uh, mechanisms and so forth for that um, that are being developed throughout the world. So it's, it's worth looking abroad um, because a lot of progress has been made in this and, and international norms in this money and politics space. All right, so um, radical transparency in particular, maybe ballot handling, vote counting, money and politics, but really as election management gets politicized, it could be also in other areas, records of decision-making, for instance, um, how people are appointed, how people are recruited and so forth. 
The next one, and I'm not sure what to call it, but it builds on, on what we're talking about, citizen resilience and so forth. Um, we could call it earnest conversations or, or, or deep cooperation, but it's this idea that elections belong to, to, to all of us and that we need to build a sense of shared purpose around these really critical issues that are facing us. And I'll just give a few examples. Um, in the Netherlands now, uh, we know that social media and, and elections, it's, it's a toxic space in elections. And so um, codes of conduct, political parties coming together and discussing together what they want to see and, and committing to those informal norms that Fletcher was, was talking about. Um, we've seen a, a growth in interagency cooperation around threats like cybersecurity, for example, election commissions working with um, uh, security agencies and working with platforms um, to come to, 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 to deal with very um, difficult issues like foreign interference um, and, and rapid reaction mechanisms for when it comes. And during the pandemic, working with health authorities. So those cooperative habits, this sense of, of we're in it together. But that also involves citizens. So for example, when Indonesia's um, election commission was under attack from parliament who wanted to undermine its authorities, it was civil society organizations who came to the protection of the, of the election commission and said, uh-uh, that's not okay. And they did big campaigns in the media to protect the election commission from that legislation. Um, so this, um, and I'll just give one final example as we start thinking about um, possibly changing um, electoral systems, and I know there's a lot of, of work in, in the US about possibly moving towards ranked choice voting and so forth, but I really encourage you all to look at the example um, of uh, British Columbia and how they brought all the citizens on board in a dialogue on what electoral system was needed. And they had that real mix of, of citizen and expert conversations about what is it that we want to, to achieve. In the end, it got politicized in a referendum and, and failed, but it was that conversation which, um, which was really important to have. So that idea of conversations is the one that I wanna leave you with, the importance of conversations um, about how we protect our electoral democracy and our electoral institutions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Trez. And, and uh, of course, I'm intrigued by what that conversation in British Columbia ended up with. We'll have a chat about that one here in Colorado. There's a lot of discussion, as we said, about ranked choice voting. And, and I think, um, you know, we do have the opportunity to learn from other countries. When I look around the world and I think, well, who's really got the most thought through electoral system that maximizes inclusivity, that you know, still retains a link between people and the candidate. I kind of come around to Bolivia and Nepal as being the two cases where I'm like, okay, you know, this is really what could you know potentially contribute to more moderate politics in, in the United States. And including uh, the Bolivia case, which is kind of interesting because as we know from the work of uh, Evans uh, Central, who's here a, a MA student, that um, you know, Bolivia has um, reserved seats for indigenous peoples. And so recognizing you know, historical marginalization and exclusion is part of this conversation and ensuring their representation. And then Nepal, of course, which has struggled with identity related politics since the end of the civil war in 2006 and has, has really also, you know, kind of arrived at these options of electoral systems. And I wonder what kind of crisis, you know, does it take in Bolivia? It was the 2019 uh, crisis around the elections where eventually the Organization of American States uh, facilitated new elections in 2020. Um, but uh, the crisis, of course, in Nepal was civil war that led to a peace agreement and then democratization. So um, how do we get electoral system reform in the absence of major crisis? I think that's a very important aspect of this. Let's move to Siad, uh, Siad Alihojic again, top specialist on uh, election uh, risk assessment um, and uh, conflict prevention. Let me move here to open up uh, uh, the uh, PowerPoint uh, from um, Asiad. Unfortunately, I've got something going on here with the uh, 
with the little blue box which is covering it, but I think we got it uh, right here pretty easily. So I'm just open it up for see it. And um, if uh, need be, I will serve as the page up, page down guy. Again, it's, it's need to be, let me see. You know what, because there are so many clicks, like every line. And yes. Can, can I maybe sit there? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Let's switch places yeah. here. Thank you, CI. And I'll try not to jump on your computer and go to Amazon for a new clicker. So. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, th th thanks, Stephen. Thanks, colleagues. And that's just uh, as as I heard from Fletcher and Tadeus, and that's I should think about saying this and that and this and that. And maybe I should, if, can I change some slides and so on to connect better. But uh, my my choice is probably now after hearing two of them of, of telling you the story, like giving you kind of insight into, into the journey that, that I've had, maybe that would be the best way to start. Because as Tim said, I, I joined the idea in 2008. There was a task on my desk and the task was develop electoral wireless early warning tool. Now I came from Bosnia after, you know, we had a, our war and since 96, I was working for OSC, electrical processes, lot of conflict, hard to navigate. And uh, it was actually brilliant opportunity that I don't think many of us get in our lives to, to, to actually work on developing something that I desperately needed for, for my 11 years when I, would, when I was with OSC and I didn't have it, right? And the, and the international idea was environment that, that really offered that. I mean, because we had access to, to academics and then we had opportunities to travel the world, to, to speak with, with, with practitioners, to see how they do things in Mexico, in India, in Indonesia and elsewhere, and, and, and kind of to have the process in which we kind of pull everything together and, and make, make something complete out of, out of bits and pieces. So where did, where did I start? I started looking into the definition of election-related violence. And in, in 2008, there was not uh, much. And, and it was Jeff Fisher's white, white paper, IFAS white paper that provided definition. And at that time, Hogland came with article 2009 and Professor Sisk with the UNDP guy. And actually, these three were early definitions of electoral violence, which are a little bit dis distinctive because Fisher points to, to, to and, and they are all important, Fisher points to threat of harm to any person or, or property or the process in itself. Uh, Christina Hovland, she kind of distinguished between the, the, the timing and the motive and say electoral violence is not, uh, 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 it, it's just, a, a, a type of political violence. And it was uh, Sisk who actually said electoral violence has a psychological and, and physical physical dimension. Right? And pretty much I don't, I've seen after that many definitions. I even wrote several definitions, <laughs> but they did not, they did not really advance from, from, from Sisk's definition. But then what I was doing was trying to really understand motives and perpetrators. So in one of the, very early papers. Uh, it was a, a book which was edited by, by one Swiss, uh, Swiss person. I, I kind of looked into, into the category and I said, well, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, violence incentive for, is incentive for those who seek electoral advantages. And, and that means that they compete in the process. And the violence is turned against their political actors, uh, their political combat, their competitors, and, and their supporters. Right? So that's that's one uh, motive and one perpetrator. Another one was disrupting electoral processes. So sometimes those who do not compete in, in elections, they have incentive to disrupt electoral processes. And we've seen Taliban's, for example, in Afghanistan. We've seen organized crime groups in Mexico and, and elsewhere who would try to uh, 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 disrupt processes because they want to weaken democratic processes and institutions. Right? The third one is preventing electoral manipulations. And there are some who righteously 
uh, resort to, to, to violence, so to say. We've seen a few parliaments being burned in the course of the, of the past decades. I remember in, in the neighborhood in Serbia when they, when they, when they torched the parliament after, after uh, elections were stolen. Uh, and again, this violence is very often quite spontaneous. There, there are civil society organizations, uh, opposition going out, very often ends up uh, uh, torching, torching some of the, of the government building. And then, I, 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 I'm not sure if this one is right, but I have it there, which is violence as respond to violence. That, that one can be challenged. Because sometimes, uh, and, and have in mind that, that electoral violence has this psychological dimension. You can perpetrate the psychological intimidation, coercion, threat, and sometimes the, respond, the response is violent. Right? Or sometimes what we see is low scale violence by one actor uh, uh, triggers a large scale violent response by, by, by another actor. Sometimes uh, 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 actor responding is, is police that is responding to a demonstration. And, and then it is worth mentioning here that uh, violence against women and uh, 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 Kelly will recognize I added this sexual, so it's psychological and sexual and, and physical is an important feature in all cases of all. So, I, and this can be challenged, expanded, shrink, but, but it is important to think about what the violence is, who the perpetrators are, and, and what their motives are. And then we come to, to prevention of violence. And here, I think we have developed what we call a three-layered approach for preventing and mitigating election-related violence, based on pretty much trying to, again, to cluster all evidence that we have found. So who has, who should prevent electoral violence, right? So number one would be electoral management and justice organization. Uh, they have very often responsibilities to make sure that violence is prevented, right? And, and, and prevention of violence that does not require uh, helmets and, and, and the guns and, and the armored vehicle, it's sometimes how, how you do things, how sensitive you are, how quickly you, you react. This is something that, that Therese was talking about. So in the way how elections are organized and how disputes are resolved in many ways is preventive, preventive mechanism. But then we should not uh, disregard the role of security sector agencies. And, and just a few days ago, I was discussing with a, with a, a Finnish uh, group of, for securing electoral processes, which is uh, uh, convened uh, and includes a state, or a state agencies convened by the Ministry of Justice, but includes every, uh, every security sector agency in Finland. Right. So there are a lot of security sector agencies and they do have uh, specific mandates to, to secure electoral processes. And then finally, there is this concept of infrastructure for peace, which, which uh, 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 Tim already mentioned. And actually this can be tracked down to elections in Ghana. They, they even called it architectures for peace initially, uh, in which they, they figured out that when they organize elections, there are these traditional leaders. They really didn't like the fact that they cannot dictate in, in their villages, who do they support? Because it was election commission who come and say, everyone should vote as, as you please. And these are candidates. And then traditional leaders said, no, we should all vote for this or that person. Which And, and there was always a conflict and sometimes violence until Far, Farijan, the, the, the chairman of the commission said, Let, let's meet with these traditional leaders. And then, let's bring them on board. And he said, okay, so we want you to be our partners to organize democratic elections. So when these traditional leaders got the space and the role in this process, then they, they went out and, and, and started preaching, preaching democratic elections. So there is a space and place for everyone in the election process, be it media, be it political party, traditional leaders, religious leaders, business community, and so on. When, when elections were, were, were held in Kenya in 2013, you know, elections were pushed from uh, August 2012 to March 2013. And interesting, I think Fletcher knows Kenya better than I was there quite a few times. We had a pr project, and this is, I think Tana River, they have this flower industry, right? So 
they all wait for 8th of March so that they can export flour to Europe, right? And then elections fell in the March. And then because so many people are employed in the, in the flower industry, they said, if we have a violence, like we will bankruptcy, like, and so these people working in the flower industry and, and, and people owning their businesses, they've been preaching peace and, 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 and peaceful conflict resolutions in, in, in Kenya. So it's about sometimes understanding who has capacity, potential interest, because, because beef this is in everyone's interest. So, and, and again, infrastructure for peace is, a, is a, you, can, you can read it, was, it was Bill of Conflict Prevention and Recovery of the UNDP, and uh, there are some special issues I, I, in, in, in some journals, but quite, quite thoughtful project. In, in fact, I think the last I, I recall when I was discussing with that, I think eight countries had ministry for, for peace. And, and they're linked pretty much to this infrastructure for peace. I, I, you, you can find more information about this. But it's important here to say that they really need to put to, to, to work together. And then in many of our resources, when Fletcher showed the table, we have action points. Because when we said, what can you do in different stages of the electoral cycle? Because they need to work throughout the electoral cycle. There are three periods, eight phases, need to come to work together, to think what, what the challenges are and, and to try to find resolutions to prevent. And then we have this table, we have forced all the time in our knowledge resources that, you know, if you are election management body, as you see what you can do, you are locked in this template where you need to see what, what security sector agencies, or what civil societies, organizations can do, because usually they would just go and read what election management bodies would do. They would not go to chapter three, which is uh, which is what civil society organizations can do. Now, we have locked the template in which they can't, they can't escape it, right? Now, how do they do it? And, and then I told you, like, we did, I did the round, it was wonderful going from country to country in Sri Lanka. What they do is civil society organization, Center for Monitoring Electoral Violence. You can see 2010. Monitoring is prevention, right? So in, in the country where the security sector apparatus serves, uh, 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 serves the, the, the incumbent uh, 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 president who is the candidate, so, you know, so, uh, preventing while police may not be that agile to, to, to respond to, uh, uh, to uh, incidents when, when, the, when the ruling party commits perpetrates violence against opposition. And very often this goes beyond the radar. But then if civil society is there, if they start mapping and, and, and showing violence that happens, it, it can't be ignored, right? So a lot of prevention of, of violence is, uh, is uh, uh, something, uh, our, our efforts led by civil society organizations. Some of you may, may have heard about Shahidi. This was a platform again developing Kenya started with like from people, for people, crowdsourcing, pointing to, to, where, to where violence is. And then there were versions of Ushahidi even for, for electoral processes. But again, online crowdsourcing can be spoiled, does not work if, if, they, if, if you are disconnected from the internet. Uh, in, 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 uh, in Colombia, they had a, a MOE, which is a civil society organizations, mission electoral, um, uh, what is the yeah, abbreviation I think. mission observation electoral yeah and and but but this way is is somehow working very closely with, with academic uh, uh, organizations with, with, with universities in Colombia it's very academic exercise for example in which they look into standard deviations right and they said if if we see that data kind of that, that deviates, that, that is the signal that something something bad is happening there. And very often that had to do with the violence and, and, the, and the co-option of, of, of uh, state institutions uh, by, 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 the, uh, by the criminal groups. And then in, in, in Mexico, Mexico had exercise where uh, at that time, if and Aline would sit with other state agencies police, again, uh, uh, judiciary, uh, but also uh, 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 these mobile phone operators with energy companies 
to make sure that there is electricity, that there are flaws, that everything works on, on, on election day. Right? And it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite a, a complex and big, big exercise in Mexico. Uh, now, so based on all these experiences, and there are, there are many more, we started developing so, so what so tool, how do we make sure that everything is there? So we developed electoral risk management tool, which has a three module in one, you, you learn about the risk factors, we mentioned process related, as Therese said, and then context related. And then there is this analytical instruments where, where you can upload data, generate these, uh, these risk maps, because maps can really tell you, you know, it, one map can replace a report of, of 20 pages. And, and then action points. And to make sure that everything worked together, we just packed it into, into software because that's the only way kind of where these three can, can interact. And, and we make everything customizable to, to users. So how does it look? So if, if there is a country, you start entering the data, you can create color-coded risk map pointing to high, media, low risks. Uh, you can have different uh, administrative layers, you can put uh, uh, static markers like dichotomous uh, 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 factors. You know, we are talking about the scales here, color codes, you can put numbers, the number of complaints we receive on a weekly basis. And this all kind of gives you a sense when the risks are materializing so, so you can act. You can also switch and see same data, you can view it as, as a trend. And so, so this is just this is just technicality. To train people on the tool takes a three day, and the software is global public good. Now, what are examples? Kenya, we have exercise, and we go there in November 2011. Elections are supposed to take place in August 2012. We ask them, so what are the risk factors? They 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 go to risk factors that we have. Add a few more. They say. This will be critical risk factors for electoral process in Kenya. So we say, okay, now we have mapped the risk factors. Now we need to understand whether they are materializing or not, because risk is likelihood of negative occurrence. It may or may not happen, right? And you cannot put standing arrangements to mitigate against every factor that materialized. That would be just exhausting, uh, exhausting uh, uh, EMB financially, uh, human resources. So they said, these are the risks. They start collecting the data. And this was the risk map in August. So you can do brilliant exercise, but uh, reality has changed. What happened here was that the Kenyan army crossed the border and then Al Shabaab started retali retaliating. So you could see that some uh, supposedly low risk regions became quite, quite high risk. Right? In Nigeria, we had exercise. Nigeria, very complex country, biggest elections in, in Africa. Number, number of, of risks there. In Myanmar, Myanmar special, uh, uh, special uh, society, we went there, but, and, and when we developed this initial mapping, we usually said there needs to be election management by the security sector agencies, civil society, academics, you know. In Myanmar, they said, no, civil uh, state agencies do not mix with civil society. So we said, okay, let's have two events, but then election commission will sit in the, in the second event. So this was the, the risk map of Myanmar in 2015 by election management body and security sector agencies. And then we had same exercise with civil society and political parties. And this is how they saw risks. So, you know, there is a little bit of discrepancy. And then I just pulled the thing uh, on, the, on, the, on the last day, I said, look, I have kind of merged your maps, and this is this is what we get. And the civil society organization, political party, everyone starts grabbing phones and taking a photo of this map. And the election commission is a little bit uh, uh, not 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 uh, not very comfortable. But I think they, they understood. And and for the second event, for the second event, they sit in a the corner. They don't mingle with civil society and political parties. Anyway, so this is this is kind of the value that is a big moment of socialization when people go through to these processes. This was mapped in Kenya on election day. We can see here that uh, materials are not delivered, that polling stations did not open, that election violence. And during the day, so this was continuously updated on, on elections day. In Kyrgyzstan, uh, elections were, election results were, uh, were annulled and, and there was civil society organization using electoral risk management tool together with the, the ombudsman office. And they've been collecting data about state of human rights in elections. 
and then I just kind of try to, to put several of these maps, but they went with these maps and analysis uh, to argue that, that you know, elections were, were quite problematic. This is Nepal, and as you can see here, they, they had a chart in which they distinguished between physical and psychological violence uh, during, during the critical phases of the elect of electoral cycle. And then they had maps and maps. In fact, the chairman of election commission, he said, everyone tries to bring me a report and the report are 20, 30 pages, 50. There is always a bunch of reports in my head. I just tell them, take it to electoral risk management team, let them put it in the map because map I can kind of manage. And if they cannot put it in the map, then your report is not good. And then these maps on the back, they had method methodology, anal analysis, suggested action points, and so on. But so far, we have been, I, I was personally engaged in about 20 countries providing training, implementing projects, advisory, and technical support together, together with other colleagues, and we continue to learn. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Faith. Well, that's it. Well, um, I switch back places here, and uh, I think I've got two points that uh, kind of come from your presentation, which I think are important. Uh, the first one is that we look back on cases like Kenya with 2007-2008 uh, post-election violence, and it had very much to do with what Perez had said about radical transparency. It was a sort of expectation from some stakeholders that the Electoral Commission was, you know, cooking the results because it took a long time um, between voting and so-called proclamation when the results are are proclaim. And then we've seen subsequent electoral cycles in Kenya where we've really thrown the whole toolbox at electoral violence prevention, and it's actually reduced the level of political violence. So the, often one of the problems with like conflict prevention is how do you know that it's worked, right? Because it's kind of like medical prevention. Um, you know, you take measures to prevent the onset of disease, but you're never quite sure whether you would have gotten that disease down the road anyway. Um, but here we have really pretty clear evidence about the importance uh, of prevention and how prevention can and does work. Uh, the second takeaway is just maybe with regard to the students, uh, take a class with me next time. And uh, rather than a report, I'm happy to accept a map. Um, as a course product, not for this quarter, but in future quarters. Um, so you know, thank you very much uh, for that. Yeah, you've been a very um, patient audience, I think. Let's uh, go around and, and uh, uh, suggest any questions or comments uh, from you all, and then uh, and then we'll go back for a final set of comments from our panelists. But um, if you've got a question or comment, just please uh, maybe identify yourself. Yes, please. Thanks. Yeah, my name is Sheila Atiba-Bandigra. I'm um, so glad that every presentation has made at least a reference to Kenya. Ah. <laughs> I come from that beautiful country. So oh, I'm fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So another thing that I also need to point out is that I run a non-profit organization that has over 14,000 members in Kenya. So it means that one of the programs that we run is democracy and governance. So the reason why I'm bringing that, um, it's important to also identify the context of measuring the, you know, uh, democracy and governance, and especially in terms of security, because the biggest challenge that Kenya has had is the ethnicity, you know, and the, the big power, political, um, the people who hold power right now are the big guys who are so economically empowered. So ethnicity has been a big issue for Kenya. And moving forward, uh, as we shared the three, the three ways, the three layers. For me, I think um, one thing, especially for developing countries and especially for Africa, the biggest thing will also be, be one ethnicity, and uh, the other thing would be. Sorry, I just read it somewhere. <laughs> the, the role of the political parties, because these political parties are influenced by the ethnic background. For Kenya, the biggest political parties are from one, one of the biggest ethnic backgrounds. So they have a backing, uh, they have backing um, of these political leaders. So. Case example right now, the president and the, um, the president, uh, the current president and the opposition leader have been working together, and these are the big political leaders, and also from the big ethnic backgrounds. So right. 
the layers will change. I think it will change depending on the country context. And I think for the least, from my experience on the ground, the business sector will not do much in terms of influencing the peace. Mm -hmm. The ethnic and political leaders will do a lot because the people listen to them and they look at them and they say, that's our person. And because there's a very big economic uh, gap, the majority of the population are under, you know, they are the poor population. So they will depend a lot on the, also oh, the president is Kikuyu and we are the biggest, so we will listen to him. Whatever the sunflower companies will say, we don't care. We can go and destroy this, you know, so it's more ethnic and it's more who's speaking and what role they play. And another thing also to mention as, We've been trying to bring in uh, women leaders, women into the political space. The, one of the biggest disadvantage of bringing women, uh, as in women vying for political position, again, is the political leaders and the influence they play because, not political, political parties. Because if the structure of the political party is not supportive of women leadership, even if you have policies and whatever, it will not work. But the moment the political parties are, are structured and are well intentioned to bring women leadership and to ensure that there's no violence and there's a lot that will work and trickle down even to the electoral systems. And lastly to mention, we have an independent electoral commission, yes, but it's not independent because the commission has been appointed by the president. So, I mean, at the end of the day in the next election year, the president can say, okay, I'm removing the commissioners and get my friends and the commissioners. So it's independent in terms of the name, but not independent in terms of the practical. And this could go across uh, developing countries, unfortunately. So the models, I think for my part, will keep on changing depending on the context, depending on, depending on the situation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the comments. Very nice comment. And you, you said so many things, which I think are really relevant and pertinent to this issue. One of the biggest kind of academic concerns that we have in this area that is sort of alluded to a little bit by uh, Fletcher in, in one of his charts was the, what we might call the ethnic um, census assumption about elections that people vote their identity um, and not necessarily their interest, be it class interest or be it uh, other forms of interest. And so I think you're absolutely right. And there are a lot of lessons learned from Kenya in this regard. And we'll come back to the panel on that. But thank you so much for your comments. Really quite nice and insightful. Um, let's go around and take a few more. Any other comments, uh, questions for our, uh, for our panelists? Or does anyone else like to jump in? But it was a good presentation. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, the last reassuring. <laughs> so, anyone else like to jump in? Yes, please. So, I'll, I myself, um, I don't want to keep East Africa here, but. Um, <laughs> Why not? <laughs> no one's their hand. Yeah, no, please. Yes, my name is Wanda Mnubalo. So, I'm from Ethiopia, so we're neighbors here. Ah, but okay. um, I think one, I have so many questions um, to say the least, but one of the questions that I raised was um, we talk about especially observers and I remember growing up you know I watch the news all over the world especially in the global south we see a lot of western observers that are present and um, now I'm you know thinking <laughs> I've studied a lot in undergrad and here as well and thinking about how um, how effective they are especially when observers are present in countries where uh, the elections are not legitimate, they're not free, they're not frequent, uh, but they go and they maybe come up with their um, conclusions to that, uh, and then they return on the next election, and uh, not saying they shouldn't. Uh, my question is, how do you distinguish um, their presence in order to um, encourage more uh, democratic systems of elections? Uh, to make it simpler, in my opinion, I'm just wondering, how uh, not being present could affect uh, elections because when you keep returning observers, it's legitimizing those elections. And uh, these regimes would continue to have these puppet elections so that uh, the international community would say elections happening. Maybe there's some funding that's attached to uh, some foreign aid uh, conversations that happen. So just wanted to know your thoughts on that and uh, whether 
continuing to be present so that hopefully someday things will change. Or if you make sure that your commitment is to not be there so that those regimes will change their ways will be one thing. Uh, another thing to Sheila's point, I think, um, not to blame it on ethnicity, but um, a lot of the emerging democracies, especially within the African continent, you have um, a lot of instability that comes with elections. So whether the regime chooses to go to uh, free elections, uh, the ways in which we compare that to the uh, Western liberal idea of democracy is different. So maybe uh, there could be elections, but uh, freedom of speech might not be as open as possible because you might have some leaders that take advantage of ethnic tensions to um, flare violence. So you see, I would say in the Ethiopia case, uh, even recently, the election commissioner uh, has told the security forces to release some members, uh, but they were arrested because they were thought to ignite some tension. So how, how do you see um, ethnicity and uh, emerging democracies are having to deal with elections? Because if we just look at it in the Western liberal idea of democracy, you have all this menu of items you want to check. But uh, I think in reality, you might have to pick your battles and uh, see what works best. But I just want to know your opinion. Yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic uh, uh, set of questions and comments on uh, on observation and also some of these kind of key dilemmas around observation. Really, really nice as well as uh, yeah, that that sort of critical question of um, I, I struggle myself with that. You know, there's a lot of research in this field about how to work at how to legislate against ethnic parties, you know, requiring parties to have geographic distribution. I think my friend Ben Riley's done some work in this regard. And, but yet ethnic parties provide voice for marginalized groups often. And so, you know, this is sort of a really interesting area. So thank you for those. Um, I think we got time for maybe just a quick one and then we'll go around. We've got a class coming in here at two. So we've got to uh, be sure to um, clear the room as it, or let them have the room. We've been watching succession and they often want to have the room. So um, <laughs> anyone else want to jump in with a quick uh, comment or question for our colleagues? Very good. Let's go back around and uh, let's start in reverse order. We'll start with Desiad. If you've got any uh, final remarks, <coughs> either on the you know things other panelists have said and yeah. or the comments. Yeah. yeah. No. Th thanks. And, and I think that these are like critical discussions. I, I think you know how can you argue with a Kenyan <laughs> about Kenya? I was there. Uh, I was there ten times. <laughs> and uh, it's it's so one thing is important. It's it's ignorance. Of, of the internationals who come into national context to work. The, the second thing, and I can say it because I was in Bosnia, I, I saw so many international uh, internationals coming in and leaving, is, is a local blindness, right? So, so that, and, and it is important to, to merge these, these two things because I, I've had international colleagues from which I learned about my country, and I've had international colleagues, which should have never come to my country. <laughs> to, to, to but I, I've, I've, I've heard a lot and I spoke a lot. And I think Kenya is a super interesting example for, for one reason. Well, for many reasons. One was that after violence in 2007 and 8, when election commission, and these are just anecdotes, when election commission staff came to work, the building of election commission was surrounded by police officers and the 800 people were told you have 15 minutes to clear your desks right because all the blame for of violence 2007 and, and 8 went on the back of the election commission of the chairman and others so they had 15 minutes to clear their desks and then the parliament says and, and the president, we will have a new election commission which will be independent, 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 and clearly report pointed to. So in Kenya, then following the, the, the referendum, they have I've never heard about that open process of appointment of election commission, in which they were on the televised live interviews for two or three hours. And I, I, I know Ahmed Hassan, Commissioner Nazibo, Commissioner Alavi. I, I was I, I, I just enjoyed and I learned so many of their stories. And Commissioner Alawi told me, he said, 
you know, someone could call and said, you have unpaid uh, uh, TV bill. And then if they find it, they, they cross you out. You had to be perfectly clear, but they've been so bruised <laughs> during elections 2034 that they had to leave. And then afterwards, you, you refer to other commission and I know that they, 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 there was never a commission who established. But this is my thought. So one thing would be always looking who is preaching violence and who is preaching peace. And if those who preach violence are powerful as they were in 2007 and eight and, and open about it, there is nothing that can save a country. And I, I, I just like echo what you are saying. If you have these leaders who preach violence, I, I, here we are working in societies which can go either way. So through our small tools, projects, engagements, we hope to make a difference, right? But if they said we have violence, I mean, there will be violence, that nothing, nothing can happen. But these small, as I said, and, and these are just anecdotes to say, and these business leaders engaged, and, and these are all nice stories. So more and more, and sometimes, this critical mass can, can tip off in one or another direction. And what, 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 what the colleague from Ethiopia said, I think this is, again, super interesting. This connects with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the resilience that, 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 uh, uh, that Fletcher was talking about. So in, in, in the theory, and hopefully in practice, to, to operationalize the resilience building, you, you operationalize it through three choices. One is, so risks are materializing. You will either reject or, 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 or overcome it, resist, sorry. You will either resist or you will ad adopt some degree of flexibility or you will transform internally, right? So there are instances in which you need to resist. And if you want to have credible and peaceful elections, you resist having elections where opposition is, 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 is locked uh, or where there, there is no freedom of speech. You should not have elections. You know, with COVID, you cannot, uh, you, you need to go with elections, but obviously you need to adopt some flexibility. And this is resilience. So keep the distance, have bus, and, and then with like social media, you, you need to, to transform yourself to be able to operate in, the, in this new environment, right? So there are, there are several critical, strategies to take it. Thanks. I, I yeah, thank you, Sia. We'll turn to Therese. Thank you. Um, so good. And um, I, I want to hope that observation has changed a little bit from when you were, um, when you said you were younger or a child and, and looking at it. And I think part of the change um, in observation is, was Ethiopia. So, um, so the, I don't, the, the, the Ethiopian case was, a, is, is a very interesting one in, in observation history because it, it pointed to something where the, the mechanics can all be there and you, you pointed to the time dimension as well. So around election time, um, this is uh, during the Meles period, elections were actually reasonably well organized. Polling stations looked really good. They opened on time. If, if, you, if you took your observation checklist, you'd be ticking everything off and it would look really, really good. And there was one point at which the Carter Center and the EU um, uh, final reports were completely different. And the reason was they'd emphasized either that the rules were followed, in which case they were, but the other one, the EU one, picked up on something that was underlying, and as you touched on. And, and that is the harder one to pick out. And it's, uh, maybe we can call it culture of fear. And in that case, which methodology are we using? And one of the things I really argue for in when I work in the observation space is that we need more methodologies pulled from anthropology and ethnography and so forth to be able to measure culture of fear so that as observers, we're not just looking at, um, you know, you, did it, you, where did the ballot papers arrive, but we're going, how did people feel? And it's that knock on the door. Like, are you worried that there's gonna be a knock on the door at uh, in the middle of the night and, and somebody in your family is gonna disappear? And that did happen during those periods in Ethiopia. And that's why, for example, the Carter Center chose um, under tremendous pressure from the Ethiopian authorities to observe um, elections um, decided not to. This was during the, the Melis period. 
Um, so uh, that's the fact that those two observation missions were different um, really uh, brought a dialogue within about um, cooperating within and, and, and also that um, methodologies to, to, to be there much, much, much longer. And that's what you're talking about as well. So I'm hoping that observation has, has changed and it's changed in a couple of ways, which is um, the real links. Say I pointed to, sometimes you can be in your own country and miss something. Um, and what international people can bring is that they've got access, they can, they can, they can amplify the voice of something that's gone wrong to the, the outside world. But they can also point out that actually this is within reason. So they can, they can bring some kind of perspective. So I think there's a value. But domestic, it can't compare to domestic knowledge. That link between domestic observers and international observers is now, it's, it's a very, very strong link and it's, it's assumed. We advocate an idea for this competence to be at the regional level. We are advocating for international for, for assistance to be um, so that, that the, 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 the knowledge, the advocacy, the, the following what's happening, the tracking if something's going wrong, that that really belongs at the regional level because that's the sweet spot. National level is dangerous because it gets politicized. Um, international is too far away that you might be missing what's going on, but the regional level, the kind of the, the ECOWAS level, that's the, that's the level that really needs to be um, enhanced to be able to call out bad behavior when you see it and to um, empower those skill sets um, that are needed within the region. Fantastic. Thank you, Therese. We'll turn to Fletcher uh, for uh, comments were just about done in terms of time, but uh, we'll turn to Fletcher for last thoughts here. I'll just make a couple of quick closing comments. We've been joking a lot in this course about how academics point to the dilemmas and the problems and the puzzles and the impossible, right, paradoxes, and then you're out there in the world actually trying to solve <laughs> on the ground. So I'll just close with something very academic. Um, your comments point to a couple of dilemmas that scholars uh, have spilled a lot of ink to talk about. Um, this question of ethnicity um, again, I, I feel like it's one that's rising to the surface in all kinds of electoral systems and cycles. And um, uh, famous kind of scholar Schmitter talks about this as an extrinsic dilemma around boundaries and identities. And the key problem is defining what constitutes a legitimate political unit. And this is really difficult, especially when we have increasing kind of levels of human mobility, rapid demographic change. This is really, really hard. So for those of you who follow the US case, we're talking about it now too, in terms of the language I hear is kind of the shrinking ethnic majority problem. I were thinking about that and how it's influencing party behavior. So again, it's ethnicity is, is playing a role in lots of different types of contexts. And I think that would be important to uh, point out. The other thing that I think that came up that's really interesting is around this idea of kind of the, the necessary neutrality of international organizations. But again, the dilemma that anytime an organization becomes part of a process of competition, you are going to become an actor. <laughs> and there are people on the ground who know how to play the game that involves international organizations. And so in my research, it took me months and months and months to get to the point where people would say, well, that's what we told you the conflict risks were, but we don't want to make ourselves look bad. Here's what we're really, really worried about. Right. And that's difficult. So that, that epistemological problem is really interesting. It's whose knowledge do we do we kind of uh, go with when we identify risks and try to hitch those off? Um, that becomes a really important problem um, with its own unique set of questions. Thanks, Tim. Well, thank you, Fletcher. Let me thank the panelists and thank you guys for coming today. Again, snowy day in Denver, week 10. You've got papers due and things. I just want to thank everybody for coming. I also got a couple of other key thank yous to make. Actually, I'll be very quick with the three of them. And one is to thank uh, Gregana and Shannon from the from the C Center for their uh, long stewardship, not only of this event, but for the whole course and pro uh, project that we've been working on. And Anna Metropolis and Dustin Allerid from uh, ICROSS uh, as well for their support in this whole project. Um, we've got two international guests and the one thing I know about them, uh, well, one thing I know about all three of our panelists is that, you know, they're professors and, and scholars and, and practitioners. Um, they're also parents. And so I wanted to take the opportunity, particularly for our two international guests, to come back to the two E's later, <laughs> Evelyn and Emerson, um, whom I call the two E's, uh, Fletcher's <laughs> children. But for uh, Siad and for, um, 
Therese, uh, we got some stuff for your kids, some of you swag. Uh, Therese has two lovely girls, and, uh, and There uh, she had uh, two happening uh, fellas. And so I just wanted to be sure that when they go home, they'll have some B swag so they can walk around, stop home, and, and uh, give a, a little shout out to uh, the Corbell School and University of Denver. So thank you guys so much for the events. Uh,